Welcome, welcome, Trinidad and Tobago, to the Good Friday edition of Plain Talk. And what an edition! I mean, it couldn't be a more auspicious day. I am joined by none other than Dr. Let me say, Member of Parliament, former Minister, Dr. Lawyer. You're almost the whole nursery rhyme by yourself, Dr. Rudal Munilal. Welcome, sir. Thank you very much. You're sanitizing, you're getting ready. Every every 15 minutes. <laughs> Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be on the show. Um, I think we had planned this before. Um, yes, we did. Yeah, last time I told you I had some meetings and other engagement, but I couldn't try that again. So I'm happy to be on the program tonight for a discussion with you. We call here. We call here. For <laughs> sure, for sure. COVID-19, we have you restricted movement. Dr. Well, Munilal, you take the first couple minutes and um, set the pace for yourself because I have some questions that I need to ask and I know well, that you well, have something. No to well, no problem at all. Um, this, have, uh, as all know, is a very difficult time in, um, in history. We are living through what you know, generations would um, live and would never face. We are living in times that the, you know, reflect movies that we watch over the years. Uh, people will born and people will die, but they will not live through this. And uh, for better or for worse, it is our generation that will face this challenge as gruesome and as brutal as it is of a global pandemic. Um, we are not exempt, the entire world. I monitor the COVID-19 data twice or three times a day, the global data. And I mean, it's shocking if I tell you and, and if we internalize that since last week, Thursday to today, 50,000 human beings have died because of this virus. Um, it is shocking. Uh, and I call upon citizens to obey the law, obey the orders, regardless of our um, differences with the authorities, the government and whichever. I think we have a duty to ourselves and to others around us to protect them by staying at home and by social distancing and just you know live trying our very best to live this through with all the resources and tenacity and coping mechanisms we have there are different phases and struggles like these the first thing of course is shock the second thing is of course to stay home and wash hands and so on but we also coming across now the mental and emotional trauma of all that this means because this these things have apart from the medical issues and so on which i'm not qualified to speak on these disturbances in, in human evolution have serious impact upon our mental and emotional state um you know the the nature of family and industrial society so it is a testing time i mean i'm home talking to you i haven't left this place you know i, I don't know about 10 to 12 days now um so that it is a struggle and i ask all to join us and to, to do as much as they could to ensure that they stay home, they tell others to stay home, and we, we work and we pray, and hopefully, you know, this will also pass. Doctor, you are a doctor of? I'm a PhD I... in employment relations and industrialization, and an attorney and at law as well. Also an attorney at law, and a seasoned member of parliament. I want to ask you a question to begin to begin the show, um, sure. and I know everything that you said just now there, and I underscore what you just said. I want to ask you, in your words, what is the role of the opposition in well, Westminster? The role of the opposition in Westminster politics is, by definition, to hold the government to account to hold the executive to account, to scrutinize the executive, and to defend the rights of the people. Philip, I have served in government for five years plus more. I was there in the Pandey administration too. And when you're in government, regardless of who it is, there's always a tendency to, to move quickly and to, to do what you have to do. And sometimes when you're in government, you, it can slip. Uh, in terms of your thoughts and your whole processes because you are so hurry to achieve it could slip in terms of constitutional rights uh, human rights protection and so on worker protection for example and the role of the opposition is to do that regardless the opposition cannot um, approach its task on the basis of panic or hysteria the opposition always approaches tasks on the basis of 
calling the executive to account, calling the government to account, and holding the government respons responsible for policy, for expenditure, and for law. You said in your opening ambit, you said that this is unprecedented time. This is this well, is historic. It's we, we have no we have nothing ready to gauge it by the last time the world the world went through something like this it was a hundred years ago during the the, the, um, the Spanish flu that, that killed a sure. um, hundred million people, 50 to 100 million people. So there is every understanding why the world would be panicked. I want to scale everything down to Trinidad and Tobago though, because this is the theater of this operation. So sure, fine. January 31st, 2020. January 31st, 2020. Oh. The President of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago proclaimed legal notice number 34. Are you aware of that? I'm aware. What did you think was the ramifications of, procl of proclaiming legal notice number 34? Well, you're correct. Uh, legal notice was proclaimed on the 31st of January. You're correct. Could I also tell you what else happened on the 31st of January? On the 31st I wanna, of January. Before, before you add that, because that's the road we're going down. But I just want to ask. Oh, okay, go ahead. Yeah, on that day, the president proclaimed that this virus was infectious disease and likely and ultimately would arrive in Trinidad and Tobago. And they declared it according to law so that other actions can take place on the 31st. On the 31st, Dr. Tim Gopi Singh also moved a motion in the parliament to debate as a matter of urgent public importance the COVID-19 virus. He was too young. Dr. Vickers, take a minute. No, I'm coming today. But that's yeah. why I was asking, as an attorney at law, what did you think was the legal ramifications of legal notice well, number 34? Before we go well, so to where, yeah. It has serious legal ramifications because that triggers a series of events and, con and consequences and implications for law in that you can then act under public health ordinance, you can then take other actions because it has been declared as an infectious disease that is approaching, that is coming, that is likely, that will interfere, that will affect your state. So that, that has serious, serious legal implications. But Philip, on the 31st of January, I put it to you that you didn't know that happened. And the rest of the population did not know. And I put it to you further that the Parliament of Trinidad and Tobago did not know that was signed on the 31st. I didn't know legal notice number 34 took place because there was no information in the media to get me to know that. You in the parliament and you would have advice on that. But I want to tell you I something. Have, we were the same we were, as you. You didn't get the information. No, in the parliament, we were never told in the parliament that this was declared an infectious disease pursuant to the legislation. Now, let me tell you what Dial Singh said. Terence Dial Singh, Minister of Health, he said, and I quote, in 31st January, in a statement in the House, it's called ministerial statement. He said, and I quote, the government is fully aware of the risk factors to this country and is in control of the situation and has put measures and resources in place to manage this risk. He goes on, and I quote, we are in a state of readiness in the event we have to treat with the virus in terms of social uh, in terms of isolation centers, qu quarantine facilities, health personnel, personal protective equipment, we are in a state of readiness, unquote. That is what Mr. Dial Singh told this country on January 31st. Today, and I don't want to jump too far because I know you want to take it sequentially. Today, we are told that if you're going in the supermarket, use a bandana or a handkerchief and cover your mouth. Today, we are told that we are not testing yet. We don't have mass testing, as the opposition leader called for some time ago. Today, we are told, go in your kitchen and bust up a jersey and try and make a mask yourself. Now, that is where we are. Having been told on January 31st, we are ready for all eventualities. Dr. Munilal, the Progressive Empowerment Party, a part, we are, we are preparing to donate. I spoke to the Commissioner of Police today. We are preparing to donate 2,000 masks to the police service and i know other organizations are getting ready to start making masks and other uh, devices available to people on the front line because as you just said this prepared for any eventuality announcement what exactly did that translate to mean it means it meant nothing 
because as of the second week in April, we don't have testing taking place anywhere except Kafra, and I'll come to them just now. We don't have masks for the population as a whole. We don't have a clear sense of how many people are infected. We certainly don't know uh, the widespread infection that may be there. And this society is, every time, every day you open the papers, there's some issue with Cora. And I want to, um, Philip, I want to just tell you again, because I keep my records, as, as you know, it was, the, it was on March 29th, a few days ago, in an express article, in an express article, March 29th, the chief medical officer in this country is the chief medical officer, Dr. Roshan Parasram. He said, and I quote, this is what the chief medical officer said, he said, we are fortunate to have the Kuva Hospital and the Arima Hospital almost completed, end of quote. Now, if we did not have that Kuva facility there and they, they, it was not prepared and ready, all now those patients would have been sleeping in the President House, the Diplomatic Center, the Red House and Stolmeyer Castle because that is where they, their emphasis was to finish. So we cannot take this government at face value. We have to fend for ourselves. And I compliment you. You are moving to assist law enforcement. We did it a few days ago. You'll notice we gave out water and so on. But I compliment you for the action and all the NGOs that are taking action to assist law enforcement and the health sector. Test for one million population is the guide being used in the world to say that you are in a position of readiness. Trinidad and Tobago, our test per one million is 747. Barbados's test for 1 million is 2,561. Well, that speaks volumes. As I said before, the United States, I don't have the number here, but they probably tested, I mean, I'm not sure, but they probably tested in excess of a million people. The but United States number test per million is 10,617. Right, we have the lowest the testing. Test 2,538,789 people. Okay, Philip, all the statistics is good because we'll get all of that after the show. The point is we have a low degree of testing in this country. Why is that? Why did the minister tell us we are prepared and today we cannot test? Do you know there was a circular on the internet? No, I'm praying to God that was a fake news. Huh? But I'm going to tell you, and if it is fake, well, then we are very sorry. I'm very sorry to raise it. But I saw today an ad in the internet, social media, where CAFRA, this Caribbean public health institution that is testing, they are advertising now for experts who they need to hire to confront this problem that we face. Now, these are serious scientific positions they are, they are advertising for. Now, are these people by the street corner, by the standpipe, sitting down waiting for a job? That is not the retrenched workers of CPEP that you're going to hire. That is highly qualified scientific people. When are you going to get them? Where are they? So that while the minister should have been working with the private sector from January to build capacity for testing, they ignored the private sector. And I want to put it to you. This government felt that they could have used a pandemic to win a second term in office. They believed that they could have used COVID to get into power for a second time. So they wanted to do it alone. When Mrs. Prasad Bissessa went to a meeting, took Lakram Budu, uh, Tim Gopi Singh, Dr. Rowley said, will you bring them doctor for? We have enough doctor. We don't need no more doctor. Will you bring them for? Today, those same doctors could have been advising them on hiring experts to increase the capacity and capability of CAFRA to test on a wide scale basis. When are you going to test? You're going to test when we get a vaccine for COVID? You're going to test when we have uh, 50 people dead? So that is the situation. And this incompetence, as I said before, health sector workers, police deserve a clap. The government deserve a slap. Right. That's funny. Dr. Munilalo, has the government usurped the authority of parliament and is running the entire country now by press conference? Well, they are running the country by press conference. And as I said before, they are making laws in the press conference. They are canceling policy in the press conference. They make policy by, by VOOP and they cancel policy by VAPS. They, they determine what is happening in this crisis here by walking into a press conference. And I think whoever talked to them last, that is the mind, they changed their mind and they, they say, do this. Look, look at this scandal involving this private security business. Now, Philip, I know you have your head hot with this business and you have been a, a champion in some of those issues. 
Let me put it to you. Absolutely nothing is wrong with any policy that asks private security providers to support the TTPS. Nothing is wrong with that in principle. All we have said is that you have to do that program in a transparent manner. You have to do it on the basis of fairness and equity and ensure that everybody have a chance so they can get in and you can support the police. Nothing is wrong with that principle. You know, this government, incompetent as they are, they screw up the thing again. At the end of the day, let me tell you something. Do you know business people are sending, they have to send watchmen and, and helpers to their business place three times a day to make sure nobody break in, nobody thief anything, nobody is inside their, um, you know, living. Because yeah, the, the, the whole country is in a state of panic. Yeah, but you say there's no, nothing wrong with hiring private security. And if the existing security mechanisms in the country tapped out, I would agree with you. But where's the army in all of this? Well, as you know, I mean, you have been around a long time. You can use the army for joint patrol with the police. But in a state of emergency, if they would declare a state of emergency, you can use the army as well to come out on the street and assist with law enforcement. And there are particular laws that give them power of arrest, that give them search and so on. There is no state of emergency. The government will not declare that. In, in this case, the army can and has always worked with the police in what we call joint patrols. I, um, unless you are seeing it, I can tell you, I do not see any joint patrol. I do not see any um, army on the streets anywhere. Um, the few times I've been out in the last few weeks, uh, it is not happening. And the army is there to support the police. So they did not, did not use the defense force. They up for private security and then screw up the whole thing with that type of approach. Is it because some of these private security companies have inside connections with political parties, especially the bigger ones? Well, big business, as you know, regardless, big business, whether it's in construction, it is in private security, it is in media, it is in um, yeah, insurance, banking, as you know, too, it is in bond raising. Big business have connections with, with all governments. That's in nature. In fact, do you know in BP and so on, they have a, a man paid a, a $100,000 a month. You know, it's his title. It's called government relations. Now, I look in UWE, I look all over the world. I didn't see a degree in government relations. But these people are in the, the, the lays with all governments. And that's a reality of life. You cannot, stop that. you cannot stop that in our lifetime. What you can do is put institutions in place to ensure that you follow the law, that you follow fairness and equity in the distribution wait, of wait, resources. Four and, a, four and a half years into this government, almost five years into this government, we still do not have a procurement law. So which law should have guided this process? Well, it is simple. We still have the Central Tenders Board in place. When you procure anything, when you procure anything, you go through what's called open tendering and so on. Or sometimes you will have selective tendering, meaning you throw out a bid for a group of businesses or a group of people. That's fine. Mr. Young, to my understanding, did nothing. It wasn't open tender. It wasn't selective tendering. He just went, found um, a file somewhere and pulled out these names and said, listen, we've given them the work. Let her go and do it. You cannot operate like that. Let me tell you, a former minister of government was investigated by the Integrity Commission for doing the same thing that Minister Stuart Young is doing. And I put it to you, Philip, Stuart Young posed a threat to this country, to its constitution and its, and its law. I don't know why he has no understanding of the difference between a minister and a politician and a policeman. He has been trying to be a policeman for, I think, a year and a half now. He's trying to make law while he's speaking. I think that fallen penal did more damage than we thought because every time he opens his mouth is some policy contradiction. It is some stupidness. Look at the, the matter today. Could we get it now? This Barbados yeah. um, people. Yeah. No, this matter is a simple matter. The people came back from wherever in the world. They rushed to Trinidad. They missed the deadline by 12 hours or so. You tell them, stay in Barbados. The Bajan government had to show humanitarian grounds to keep them. They were quarantined at their own expense. This government refused to allow them to come on a British Airways flight that was coming here empty, which they had paid seats to come to Trinidad. We, we refused them. A few days ago, a condo aircraft was leaving Barbados to Tobago. It, the aircraft, the airline from Britain, huh, told them, we will put you on the plane free of charge and bring you to Tobago. Come. The government so no, said, no, 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 no. We don't want them here. We want them testing Barbados. I put it to you, Philip, and check the, go on Google quick if you could. No country in the world 
at anywhere, whether it's from Russia, come back to America, has ever asked the host country to do testing of their nationals before sending them back. They take their nationals and then they put them in quarantine to test them. This is the only country in what the world the at this moment that has asked for what testing. What's the difference between these 33 people, the ones in Suriname, what's the difference between them and the people who are on the cruise ship? Well, why, let me why, begin have by why have different policies for that? Well, let me put it this way. We read in the newspaper that that cruise ship was organized by a PNM senator a lady, and I, I, I really I, I express deep condolences on her passing. A lady passed away uh, coming out of that matter. But the lady told the priest, and it was in the Sunday newspaper last week, that the, she told the priest before dying, of course, that the prime minister had intervened to bring them back. Now, you know what's interesting, Philip? Did the government tell the authorities in Guadeloupe that before you send back those Trinidadians to us at Piaco International Airport, test them first before they come back? Why you didn't test them in Guadeloupe, where they were? You brought them back to Trinidad to quarantine and to test. But the people in Barbados, you say you can't come back home or let's test them there. That is the different strokes with different folks. Now, I am not, uh, you know, I'm not a no race head. I'm not saying nothing about race. But this clearly is different treatment to different people. And the government will be held accountable, I believe, in the but court of law and the court of public there, opinion. That point there. Because right now, we do not have a state of emergency. What is going on with our courts? The people who are watching this show now, everybody's asking the same question. Where then do we turn to to have this government brought to account, held to account, or have we lost control of the democracy? What happens, um, Philip, yesterday, if I'm not mistaken, the Commonwealth Lawyers Association issued a letter, very strong letter, uh, you should read it if you didn't yet, in which they called upon Commonwealth governments to restrain themselves at a time like this, that they yeah. ought not to be making law for the purpose of political objectives, that they ought not to be abusing the law, they ought not to be using a time like this to discriminate and abuse citizens, undermine constitutional and human rights. Is the Commonwealth lawyers. They also point out in that letter, very interesting, that the parliament in these countries are closed and therefore the executive has a run that they could run with policy and law and they are not susceptible now under the scrutiny of the parliament at this moment. And they warn the governments that they must abide by the rule of law and they will, they will account to parliament eventually, but they will also account to the court in Trinidad and Tobago and elsewhere. What is excusing them from accounting to parliament? They have decided that the parliament ought not to meet because of the nature of the crisis, sitting together and so on, is bad and Sorry, calling no, out people who mad. No, but they have not been... My friend, there, there are several apps, as you know, that can take a hundred people on an app and more, and you can easily convene a parliament online. That is easy to do. Apart from that, you can call well, the parliament... Can you, force them, can you force them to convene parliament? You cannot force. A government has the, 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 the ultimate right to convene parliament. It is the government. But you can tell the parliament that quorum is 12. You can tell the government that you can call a parliament and ask the parties to convene members for 12 or 14 people, as the case may be. So you have a quorum and you pass and you debate important law. On the last occasion, um, Philip, it was only, unless I'm mistaken, only about 14 people were allowed in the chamber and other members had to sit elsewhere and watch TV and follow and so on. So parliament could be convened. It's just you have to manage it. Apart from that, there are applications like this one where you can easily put 100 people on application and do video conferencing and do a parliament meeting quick, quick, quick and have your view. So they've not declared a state of emergency which would bring them under the, under the ambit of the parliament and they are not convening the parliament so what exactly is this? Is this government by fiat? Is this legal? What they're, what they're doing is government by press conference. Um, they're making declarations at press conference and call it law. And, you know, several lawyers are telling you that these things, you cannot undermine constitutional rights in a press conference using orders and subsidiary legislation and so on. So that, will, that debate will continue for a long time. But the government is not at this moment, the government is not keen to observe the rule of law. They are not keen to ensure that citizens' rights are, 
are protected. Otherwise, the Barbados citizens, the Suriname people who are there, Margarita and so on, would have been home safe at this moment. I want to take you back to January 31st, when the opposition first raised the issue of coronavirus. It was yeah. not yet COVID. It was, it was coronavirus. Take us back to that January 31st. When the opposition, now the opposition is the only political party in the parliament at this moment that would have in its um, ranks medical doctors who are not only general practitioners, but specialists. And they monitor global medical news through journals, magazines, information, internet, and so on. So we were very clear on the danger that this posed. And early o'clock, we tried to debate it in parliament so that we will be discussing like we're discussing now. In fact, me and you discussing a motion of urgent public importance. Now we are discussing policy, we are discussing law, we are discussing preparedness, and that is what the opposition wanted to promote. The parliament decided, the speaker decided that, look, this is not important enough today. Hard luck for you. The government said, boo, we don't want to hear that. We prepared. And today, they tell you, bust up your shirt and make a jersey, uh, make a mask and put it on and go out the road. So the, the government has not prepared. And the crisis we face now is not just the COVID-19. It is a crisis of leadership in this country. Had we, you know, people ask me, had we been in office, what would I be different? What would I do? Uh, we would not have COVID. Well, maybe would I be safe? I said, no, no, no. If we were in office, Mrs. Prasad Bissasa would have set up a team by last year, November, December there. And said, listen put everything in place we would have sourced two three hundred thousand masks by now we'd have been testing at least fourteen thousand people which is one percent or so of the population we'd have been testing widespread testing we'd have had facilities organized properly now you know what they do when they open kuva hospital you know it took a pandemic to open the kuva children hospital huh? when they open the hospital they say okay that is under north central regional health authority they will manage it you cannot take approach like that. You must have a specialized institution, management team, and so on, that is managing that alone. So when you hear people complain that they're not getting water or food or something going wrong, you cannot manage a crisis as if it's a day-to-day -day normal activity. When you raise the issue in the parliament, that was the same day of the proclamation. Is it that the sure. speaker was unaware that there was a state well, the, speaker, the, speaker has a duty to, the speaker has a duty as the as one of the highest office holder in the country to keep herself or himself as the case may be informed of national and international developments that's the role of the speaker the speaker must monitor news national and international to know what but might be important the, what the, will be critical how could the speaker of the house have not known that that was proclaimed well, again, I don't want to be judgmental because the government, when they do these things, they ought to have communicated with the Speaker and the President of the Senate, all legal notices, you know, uh, things go to their attention. I don't want to say they got it or did not got it, did not receive it, but that is the situation that they ought to have known. They ought to have known. Um, look what has happened now. The Minister of National Security, to remind you, has opened the border for the Venezuelan vice president to come in this country with her delegation. She came here to discuss COVID-19. Now, they couldn't discuss that on the um, phone. They couldn't discuss that by video conferencing as to what we're doing now. She had to come here with her delegation, pass through the airport, no, absolutely no quarantine, absolutely no um, testing, absolutely nothing. She came, she visited Dr. Rowley for one day after the United States. Uh, indicated that they had indicted Maduro and others for narco trafficking. She came in this country with a delegation. Whether she came here to talk to Rauli or to shop or whatever, we do not know. But what is the difference between her coming here with her security and Dr. Rauli raising all this nonsense about race and his race? I want to tell you, I agree with Dr. Rauli. The matter has to do with race. It has to do with a race between Rauli and Stuart Young as to who could be more incompetent and stupid. That is a race this has to do with. No other race. When, when you left office, would, would, you, would you be aware of how many ventilators this country had? What no, was our capacity? No. Yeah, I won't, I won't be aware of that as more the medical people would have an idea. But what I could tell you is that when we left office, the Arima Hospital, the Point Fourteen Hospital, ought to have been finished by January 2017. 
if they had continued the work. They stopped the work to change the terms of engagement and contract because the contract at that time wasn't um, attractive to them. Let's put it that way. So they went and renegotiate contract. Today, the point of 14 hospital is not open. Tonight, as I talking to you now, we have people working in Arima on the hospital, trying to fix the grass and landscape and what have you to open the Arima hospital so that they can deal with the COVID-19 challenge. Had we been in office, those buildings and those facilities would have been open a long, long time ago. Dr. Munila, a lot of the people looking on, some of the missteps and mistakes the governments have made borders on criminal and reckless disregard for human life. If you knew on January 21st, 20 to quote legal notice number 34 what the president proclaimed was that the minister that, that trinidad and tobago has been advised by the world health organization of the existence of 2019 novel coronavirus a highly infectious and dangerous disease which is currently occurring in various infections in the world and believes that due to the speed and ease of international travel trinidad and tobago can ultimately wow. expect the of the of the virus and the devastating effect on public health to the people listening and this is this is what's escaping the conversation trinidadians do not understand i myself don't understand how we could consider this a republic a nation ruled by law and there be no means or mechanisms to hold the government to account for its role and responsibility once elected to office but you see the governments in this country operate on a five-year cycle. There's a parliament to hold you accountable. There are other institutions in place. But when you are going you through an emergency the like this, they have, when you go through emergencies the like this, they have suspended. They have suspended all our all institutions so that they have this a power and authority now that they must rein in, and that is the issue. All the lawyers are saying that they will be they will find themselves in difficulty in the court. They will find themselves in difficulty in the court when citizens take litigation and the litigation go to the court and the court rule that the government abused their power during a period of emergency. Stuart Young, I have called upon him to resign already. He is concerned with how much people sneaking into bars and so on to drink. You know, there are people sneaking to this country and the Southwest Peninsula as the military escalation gets more and more profound in Venezuela. Yes. Venezuela yes. are running to add more. A senior immigration officer resigned his job. I know this. He's a friend of my family. He spoke to my parents. I learned this today. That's not made news. And he's resigned his job because of that, because there is nothing being done to stop the free flow of illegal immigrants into the country. The borders are as wide open as they ever were. Again, the question everybody wants to know is, if the parliament's role is to keep the government and hold it to account, and the government could resist convening the parliament. What then are, is the recourse to the people of Trinidad and Tobago? Listen, there is a law and there is a power greater than the parliament. In, in modern democracies, since the beheading of Oliver Crom uh, Cromwell, the people have power. It is the power of the people that will hold a government account. When the parliament cannot meet, when the courts don't open, when the integrity commission cannot meet, it is the people that have to stand up to a government. And the people, I put it to you, the people are taking note. The people are taking note because you are not the only voice out there. There are many voices. Look what happened last week when the um, matter with the private security broke. I mean, the, the government faced the wrath of the people. So the people are the final arbiters in political matters with or without the parliament and this and i think the, the population of this country is very very sensitive very educated and aware it is not everybody who is unaware of what is happening the government sometimes talk as if they're talking to everybody who fail common entrance but people are aware they are knowledgeable and they will wait for the government they will say listen you do what you're doing we will wait for you and the public i, I the public is very, very critical at this stage to be informed and to raise their voice on the internet, the social media, and the mainstream media. Yeah, but Dr. Murilan, I mean, this is a consequence of all of us being home and having time on our hands. These same people, if they were out at work and doing what their everyday chores, they would normally be doing. You would never have gotten the size of a backlash. And again, if we have to wait on the public to hold the government to account en masse, as happened over this private security contract, then what's the point and purpose of having a government or a parliament? They, you are living right now in extraordinary 
circumstances. These, these are not normal times. In fact, as I, as I put it to you on my cap, we are really in a state of war. And when you're in a state of war, you have to act according to the rules of war as well. We are not in a normal state. But having said that, the government has a duty to account to the people, even during war. Even during this time, they must account. And they cannot account for their spending. Mrs. Passat Bissessa has raised the issue of spending. We have to hold the government account from now as to what are they spending the money on. How much money was for the private security? How much money is going to the food cards? How much money is going for the... Uh, uh, Philip, we haven't yet spoken about this. Do you know that this salary review grant, they just review the formula? They, they, they are non salary review grant. It had no policy. It had no detail. Two weeks later, they come and say, listen, this thing looking like a cucumber. So we're changing the form now. The, the pandemic leave, you ever hear about that since they announced it? They don't even have a policy. They did not even pass in the cabinet the pandemic leave. So no pandemic leave. It is easier to, to apply for a United States visa than the salary relief grant. I put it to you. So that the government has been tripping on itself all the time because they think they could do it alone. They don't want help. They don't want professional help. All these um, relief grants that they have, they are pathetic in terms of their conception, in terms of implementing. Look, I, I tell you, why did you not ask the employer? If we were in office, I would have suggested employers as they retrench, as they fire, as they reduce staff because of COVID, simply send an email to the Ministry of Labor. Say, I am staff member Philip Alexander has been relieved yesterday because we are closing our shop. His ID card number is XYZ and, we, and his address is ABC. And we send you a check in the mail because you have been laid off. And what we can do is do the forensic accounting and so on after the emergency. And anyone who abused that process, we, we hold them to account. But, but you cannot go and ask people, poor people in this country, domestic workers, you ask them for the NIS, you ask them for a letter from their employer. Now the employer send them home because they don't want them in the house. You're telling them, go back to the house and get a letter that they were retrenched or sent home. So that this is not people friendly. It is not worker friendly. And the government, because they don't have people, I think, who are experienced or knowledgeable, all these grant programs are coming to naught. People are just cussing and quarreling on the road. I mean, as a member of parliament, I could tell you, myself along with my colleagues, we spend our whole day dealing with WhatsApp, with text, with phone call about food card. There's a whole day you spend with food card. And if you don't do deal with that, a constituent will, will abuse you if, if you don't uh, treat with them with that request. So that there must be a better way to deal with the groups. I mean, the government could have just, could have just gotten a listing of people who are unemployed, people who are self-employed and so on, and make the system faster and smoother, and then do what's called backburner accounting to ensure that people don't abuse and break the rule and so on. You hold them to account. But this bureaucratic and burdensome and onerous process of these grants are causing more pain than relief. How many times did the opposition raise the issue of coronavirus in the parliament? Well, I lost count after the 12th time. I stopped counting um, after the 12th time. Um, Minister Gopi Singh as well, former Minister Gopi Singh. I remember the next one. He raised a motion of urgent public importance on the safety of health workers. He was raising the concern because he had intelligence that health workers were not being provided with gloves, with um, uh, what you call the protective equipment and so on. Philip, do you know, a, yeah, Philip, do you know a couple of days ago, and this is the fact, the Ministry of Health sent a truck to, to health centers and to hospitals. You know what they send the truck for? They send the truck to take away gloves, what is called scrubs, what is called um, other protective equipment like a mask and so on. They took it away from health centers and hospitals. You know why? They said that has to be distributed to the disaster management people so that the minister could come and give the public and the minister could, could um, get a good public relations picture that he's given out to the public. So you take away from the health workers to go and give the public because you did not buy any. You didn't procure. I mean, a mass is a cheap thing. A government like this could not even buy a few hundred thousand masks to give people. You see, but Philip, this is a deeper issue. As I keep saying, the same government that gave us the Seabridge fiasco that gave us the Petrotrin fake oil. We expected them to manage a pandemic. Now, that is the problem. If people are incompetent for four and a half years, how could you become competent in six months? Huh? A, a, a pandemic don't make people competent. A pandemic kill people. It don't make them competent. 
and we expected this government to respond with competency. Why did the opposition bring the issue to the public in the streets if they knew it was an, an urgent and pressing issue? The, um, Philip, this matter was raised not only in the parliament. I could tell you on the Monday night forum and UNC meetings and so on, this matter was being raised all the time. Not only by the doctors in the, in the parliament, but by us, by people like us. We were raising this all the time. I was speaking about workers' rights, for example, during this COVID thing. Before the first person died in this country, I was speaking about workers' rights during this crisis. And today, I'm speaking about workers' rights again. I made a call a couple of days ago that health workers, Philip, should be given some type of priority now in terms of insurance, in terms of compensation, in terms of, you know, some of the, the, the policies so that health workers who are on the front line, who are exposing themselves now to great risk, I mean, a risk of debt that they are provided with compensation and, and not just compensation in terms of money and bulk money, but facilities. Do you know doctors in other parts of the world what happened? When you have to work one shift, two shift, three shift, and so on in a row, they actually put you up in dorms in the compound or near the compound of the hospital so that you do not go home and in the event, in the event that you are infected, you don't infect your mother, your father, your son, your daughter. In Trinidad and Tobago, the doctors, the nurses, they go home. They go home and they finish. And then they come back, they sleep two, three hours, and they come back again. We don't have facilities. Fitzgerald Hines, who has absolutely nothing to do with his life, you know, he has nothing to do with his life except I think he, he, he trapped water and beat him sometime. He got, took objection in the middle of a newscast. He wrote a letter on Facebook saying, Munilal talking rubbish by calling for compensation. Do you know I have here on my, my data, and I could tell you, because I, I mean, I don't like talking too much without facts. The president of the Nurses Council, um, this is it, Mr. Stewart, uh, had caused to send me a letter, a letter dated Philip. The 13th March 2020, 13th March, that's just a, 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 less than a month ago, in which they wrote to the Ministry of Health National Administrator Nursing Services. And you know what they recommended? This is the Trinidad Tobago Registered Nurses Association. They recommended, Mr. Mann, compensation, risk, what they're calling here, risk insurance, ongoing monitoring, providing workers with adequate protective equipment, um, in sickness benefit in the event that you are infected by COVID and so on and so on. Many things, there are many things. So when I make that recommendation, I make it on the basis of what the nurses are asking for, what the doctors are asking for. You didn't drop from a sky, Minister Fitzgerald Hines, who has nothing else to do with his time, writing up all day and night. He, by eight o'clock in the morning, before that fella drink a cup of Milo, he write five letters on the Facebook already. That is a waste of time kind of people we have managing the affairs of this country. Well, if you were a normal citizen, not in opposition or government, and you were looking on and you were hearing the responses here, wouldn't you lose faith completely in our system and, and wonder why we would even have an opposition? No, you see, I remember hearing a long time ago, the parliamentary democratic system is not the best system, but we're still looking for a better system, huh? in that the parliamentary democracy has a usefulness, it has a utility value in bringing issues to the fore. Parliament is to parlay, it is to debate, it is to raise policy, it is to debate law, so that there is a value in that. But when a government uses its majority and its office holders to overrun to, with arrogance, I am being confirmed now, someone is telling me, that we raised this matter of COVID six times as a motion of urgent public importance and several times during debates and so on. So six times it was turned down. And today, we're hearing that we need to bust up a jersey in the kitchen or go in the garage if you have an old cloth wiping oil from the car, wash it and make a face mask with that because the government cannot provide you with so basic a necessity as a low-cost face mask that they could not have provided. So that is the crisis we face. But I do not blame the parliamentary democratic system for that. Um, I believe that what has happened is that the government is arrogant. The government believes they can do it by themselves. And they don't care. They simply do not care. What is happening in Barbados now with those citizens there? The government simply don't care. Every time you say that, though, what you expose is that our system does not really account to the people except one time at election time. But right now, tonight, the vast majority of the people that Stuart Young says feel safe, they don't feel safe. 
what they feel is fed up of corruption in government. And they stood up against what they saw was a corrupt issuance of a contract of four security companies that made no sense at a time when the nation locked down the streets empty and the army still down on the base. That's what the people stood up for. But if the people didn't stand up for that, Dr. Munilal, what tonight we would be they would be patrolling at eighty-seven thousand dollars a patrol. But this is what I made the point to you earlier. I told you that the, the, the people also have an important role to play in democracies. Democracies cater for the people. This is why when you're in parliament, you make laws that promote the rights of citizens, the rights of workers. So it, it goes hand in hand. It is not a, it's not an issue of you choose this or you choose that. They must work together. Parliament must work with people because you must give people the rights. When I was in government, I used to make an important statement in parliament and to my colleagues outside. I said the role of government is to protect the people from us. Now that sounds strange, huh? but when you're in government, you must protect the people from you because the government has a tendency to be overarching, to be high-handed, to be arrogant. Governments can do that over time. And you must protect citizens from you. This is why it's a UNC government that gave people judicial review, freedom of information, equal opportunity legislation, OSHA, because you have to increase the level of rights on the ground. Do you know a judicial review matter can start any day now on any matter involving Stuart Young and this, um, this business with the nationals outside and so on? That is a right you give citizens. So citizens assert their right. All the, the protection citizens have to speak, for example, you have to protect it in law. And that is how they speak. In another country, in another time in history, somebody raised their voice um, like that fellow on the TV program in the morning and attacked the government. Listen, Stuart Young and others might go in there with police and drag him out, you know. But you have to create laws and institutions to protect citizens when they are critical of the government. And I don't think it's a choice between citizens and parliament. It is parliament and citizens. Now, but, but I wanted to look, ask me. Looking on, looking on as, as one of these people who are unemployed 18 days now, a lot of these people, yeah. they, live, they live today for today, what we call hand to mouth. They, they, they work this morning to, to eat this. Those people have not yet gotten any grants. Whatever savings they have has run out and they have nowhere to turn to. What is left for them other than Colm Inbert's riot? What is left for them in a country where the parliament has been locked out of the system, the opposition has been locked out of the system, the government is running a state of emergency without without calling a state of emergency. If you were one of these restaurant owners or business owners who not getting any support or compensation to help them right now, what would be your story come, come tomorrow or the day after when you're looking for money to pay your bills and, and, and keep your family alive? Um, let me put it this way. There's a lady selling watermelon and papo by the park in San Fernando, outside San Fernando. She cannot sell anymore because the police says she can't stand up or decide there and sell. It's against the orders and so on. So she asked me, of course, she needs help because she cannot make an income. So when I took up the forms, I said, well, we need to apply for some help for you. You know what the forms asking for? Where's the name of a company that registered? Um, banking information for the last three to six months. Um, how much people she hire? I said, but if she had a company registered, she would have been running Starbucks or something like that. She's selling popcorn watermelon. That is self-employed. But the government is not catering for that type of people. Now, I must tell you, you will have to see if you can find uh, some support via food cards and so on for people like that. You cannot get financial or income help for them because they don't fall within the category. As of now, I can tell you, do you know everybody for the salary review, um, salary relief grant, everyone has to be registered with NIS? and have up-to-date NIS statements and so on. The majority of domestic workers and workers at that level, people on outside, laborers and so on, they are not in the NIS system. So what is going to happen with them? A taxi driver can work on the road. You're correct, but let's get past, let's get past the politics of the thing and focus on the people of the thing because there are a lot of people in this country right now tonight the kitchen empty, they're hungry, landlord knocking on the door for rent, they don't know what is their next step. A man has been messaging me for the past 10 days, he tell me, he tell me, Mr. Philip, I don't tell me last hundred dollars. This is a father that has young children to mind. What am I to tell him? Listen, Philip, the bad news for you, 
is that quite frankly, you could tell him nothing. Because unless you yourself moving around with um, uh, salary relief grants in your pocket, there's nothing you can tell him. The government is not catering for that. All I could tell that brother, if I talk to him, is that if we do a, 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 a quick um, analysis of his household, you can apply for a food card. That is all I could say at this moment. There's nothing else you can say to that brother. And that is because the government has not catered for them. Do you know the banks in this country closing down business for not paying uh, loans and not, not doing other financial matters? How can the banks in this country, at a time like this, exercise such inhumanity, such an injustice to close down a business at a time like this? I mean, this, it, it, it is madness that is reigning here because of this, this terrible an unbelievable lack of leadership that, co that comes down to a lack of preparation, a lack of foresight and vision and leadership to manage this pandemic. You wanted to add something just now and I had cut you. What it is you wanted to add then? The, the, the point I was making is that, look, we have reached far. Um, we can get masks and so on. I think we have, I, between me and you, I think today I obtained 200 masks from a private provider. We'll distribute that. What the parliamentarians, what people like you and me cannot do is that we cannot go and embark upon testing people. We cannot. We can get masks and give people. We can give people water, but we cannot test. And the government had a duty and they still have a duty. I mean, when I read a newspaper report today, Philip, you know, till every day reading the newspaper, you think you, it's surreal that we had 4,000 testing kits come from China. And when they check on the testing kit, they realize some important component missing. So the minister, the Al Singh, say, he said, hold on, hold on. I call them in China and ask them, fellas, oh, look at send that for me, please. That is what we're working with today. And the government ought to find ways and means through international collaboration of, of um, uh, quickly, quick, quickly escalating, ramping up the testing for this virus. Unless we don't do that, we are in for a long, hard road. And that is the World Health Organization leader, I think about two weeks ago, he said it's testing, testing, testing. When he said that, I think Mr. Dial Singh was sleeping, sleeping, sleeping. And the government has not responded with the proactive you know, uh, capacity and will that is required in this crisis. Um, sometimes, uh, listen, I feel sorry for people. I receive texts from people uh, single mothers, for example, with three children. They were working before somewhere. The person has to close because it's not essential business. They are home. They have to mind three little children. No husband, no father, no grandparents, and so on in the home. And they come to you. They say, well, what can you do? You have to help me. And the only thing we can do is to look at the food care program because they don't qualify under any other government program. Is the food care And how much food care? The government in the first instance gave us 50 for children. We have about 14,000 children in our constituency going to school. We get 50. You get a next 100 now, and they say, listen, you could give people that. 100 food cards will disappear when you put it out there, and the people who are affected the most come out. They will tell you that that can't work. You need much more food cards. You need much more help, and so on. Businesses are closing down. They have closed down already. We, even have, we haven't spoken yet about small business. Any program Minister Imbert has in place to help small business. You know, look, the banks are telling people we will put a moratorium on your loan. It is not a moratorium they need that way. It is a waiver, you know, a postponement that you do not pay now and you extend loan Dr. facilities. Uh, why, why hasn't the government taken the lead on that by deferring the taxes for the next three months? Why haven't they deferred taxes so that the banks could defer loan payment interest and credit card interest so that landlords could defer um, rentals and mortgage payments. Why haven't they removed VAT from food items, suspended VAT from food items and bring the price of food down? Why haven't any of those steps been taken? And most importantly, at a time when hundreds of thousands of our people are now on the breadline day by day, has the parliament, the MPs and the ministers volunteered a pay cut? <laughs> no, in fact, if you give them a chance, they might give themselves a pay increase during this pandemic crisis. So pay cut is out of the um, question for the PNM. But what I'm saying is that at this crisis hour, the government of Trinidad and Tobago in place today, Philip, they do not think like you. You are thinking you are from Mars and they are from Venus. So they are not thinking like you. 
you talking about VAT off and subsidy on food and um, take off the tax on this and take off tax and don't pay tax and then the government is not thinking like you. They are thinking, how could we tax people more? How could we punish them more? How could we become more of a burden on citizens? That is their mindset. So you are, you know, you are from Venus and you are from Mars. I have to interrupt you for one reason, and I want to apologize. I want to speak to the PNM people who are asking me, why am I not asking Dr. Monilar Hala questions? I want to tell them, all of the questions that I have written down to ask is to get information to the public, because I know this is not the only interview I'm going to be having with a member of the opposition, and quite possibly not the only interview I'm going to be having with Dr. Monilar. But we need to know how this thing works. As of tonight, I am walking away from this interview with the fact that nothing could be done. So this is not just about bringing people on this show and kicking them up, because they have shows for that, they have kick up shows. And, and, and while I would like to say that we could continue our politics in the gutter, Dr. Mujala sure. has volunteered to come on the show, and I would like to invite Stuart Young and Fitzgerald Hines to come on the show, and they could give their side of the story too, because at the end of the day, I want to make sure the public watching this show has some information so that they know what happens next, where they can turn from here. Dr. Murila, well, thank you for I, I, coming I, I, on the show. I, 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 I want to give you closing comments. I want to give you as much time as you need. Talk you to Okay, listen, I mean, whoever these PNM people are, I mean, they could ask me hard questions, soft questions, medium questions. They don't bother me. I take questions because I am in a state of war, as you can see. So I, I am fearless. I want to end by telling you that a remarkable thing happened a few days ago. The government went into what is called the public sector investment program. That is money to ministries. Every ministry has what is called a PIC vote, a PSI, public sector investment program, PSIP. And the money is for development. Do you know the government went into the PSIP vote for agriculture at a time when food security is a critical concern, support for farmers, support for markets. And they took 28 million TT dollars from the PSIP agriculture to pay foreign British lawyers and professionals in foreign exchange, not TT dollars. They took 28 TT million to buy foreign exchange to pay British lawyers, British professionals who were here over the last couple of years on a witch hunt, on a witch hunt investigating former partnership ministers and officials and so on. They have not even found a witch. They have found nothing, not even a witch. But $28 million came out of the PSIP for agriculture. That is a criminal act. And I want to, I want to support you and endorse you when you said earlier that let me tell you something. Eh? The treatment of citizens in this country today and what they are doing to citizens in Barbados, when a 74-year-old man could cry on the phone and tell you I am they are torturing me now. I cannot come back to the land of my birth. A state is like a parent. A citizen is a child. Just how a parent treats a child, a state treats a citizen. The state takes care, embraces citizens. All over the world, countries have been taking extraordinary steps to bring their citizens back home. And you dump, you abandon your citizens in Barbados. And Mia Motley has to come to help them on humanitarian grounds. I believe that members of this government should be dragged before the International Criminal Court for that action. Thank you very much for the kind invitation to be with you tonight, and good night. Thanks for having. Th thanks for coming. Thanks for having thanks the courage problem. to join a conversation like this. And and yeah, Trinidad and Tobago. Thank yeah, that, that it comes. Uh, thank you, Doctor Murilla. It comes down to this. It comes down to politicians and members of parliament and government ministers having the courage to answer the people. This platform, and I've had, I've had every type of person on this show. I've had Gary Griffith, Jack Warner. When, when, when Susie Hardy put out her race nonsense, we brought two Syri members of the Syrian community to debunk it. I want to bring everybody on the show and talk serious talk. It's not, it's not everything in Trinidad must be a bacchanal and a cacada. Not everything must be kicking your face and throwing on your back. We're not growing forward from that. What we did tonight is we asked very serious questions about what is supposed to be going on right now in Trinidad and Tobago because the vast majority of people living press conference, the press conference, trying to figure out what is rumor, what is fake news, what is fact, 
and how to decipher what the hell the government doing and why the opposition is so silent and who they could turn to. I am tired of telling people sorry. I cannot help you. I will, if, if it were left to me, I would I would mobilize the Progressive Empowerment Party and the entire business community and start packing hampers. It may come to that by by this week here. There are too many hungry people in this country. I am going to have to appeal to the Commissioner of Police to let me line people up from Stanmore Avenue round the Savannah until food run out. It may come to that. And if you are a wholesaler, distributor, importer, and if you are somebody who cares about the people of this country and you would like to donate pallets of food to help us and if you would like to volunteer and come and get involved and help us pack hampers so that all the hungry people who have children who have not eaten for two and three days while people waiting going back and forth trying to fill out a grant in a country where we're living under the rules of a state of emergency without a state of emergency being actually declared government spending money vikey vai 50 million dollars for hotel rooms 10 million dollars for cathedrals three million dollars for security uh, patrol $87,000 per patrol. The public looking on and seeing, I just asked, have the ministers and the MPs volunteered a pay cut? The president taking her full salary. The average person in this country tonight right now running on empty and staring in to the vacuum of nothingness. We have an absence of leadership and I want to thank Dr. Murilal for bringing that information. Yes, Yes, I could have engaged in gutter politics. And if everybody I bring on the show I engage in gutter politics, you will get plenty of entertainment and no information. Tonight, tonight you understood a little more like I did how the thing works. And when we say nothing works, we mean nothing works. Because right now, tonight, what we know for a fact is the government is operating by fiat. They are not calling the parliament to order. The parliament, the opposition, can do nothing in that case. So where are we? If this is not a dictatorship in everything but name, what is it? We are working hard to get all of the right people and the bright people on this show every night. I would like to thank Satish Ramsaran of Pep Media for the tireless work that he does bringing these shows morning and evening. I'd like to thank Felicia Holder, Chairman of the Progressive Empowerment Party, for the work that she does behind the scenes, helping me book these guests that you see, and that we're working together with all of the members of the Progressive Empowerment Party and all of the best people in Trinidad and Tobago to try and get facts into the conversation. We've run for 58 years on on. Piffle. We've run for 58 years on who could say better. If you go and read some of the comments in this live video, it is embarrassing and shameful that grown-ups, grown-ups will defend nonsense that their government doing just to spit in the face of the opposition. And if you rotate the chairs, the same thing will happen on the next side. That cannot continue to be who we are. This name, shame, and blame nonsense that coming to nothing, getting us to nowhere, keeping a track of how they spend, what they spend, and how much they take, and where they take, but we never get it back. And nobody being brought to justice, and nobody making a jail. And it took us 15 years to prosecute Ish and Steve, and we spent almost as much money as they stole in Piaco, trying to prosecute them for what they stole in Piaco. Johnny O dead and leave skyscrapers in Toronto. We know all of that. We talk called the hard. We talk everybody. A million dollars a mile to put on an inch, inch of pitch. Trinidad and Tobago is a broken, corrupt nation. And until the people of Trinidad and Tobago stop engaging in petty, spiteful politics and start working together as one people under one flag, we're not going anywhere. Until tomorrow, stay safe, Trinidad and Tobago. Yeah.